So a big audience, a big uh, um, clapping for Peter Breiner on stage. Thank you. Peter. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this, is, this is my first. Considering how old I am, it's maybe a bit surprising, but this is my first talk at a conference ever. I've never been to a conference, and I never talk. I usually, even when I'm on stage, you only see my back. So this is first time you've seen my front. Uh, this is called how to conduct the business when your business is conducting. Uh, the conditions of classical music distribution have changed completely in the last couple of years. And uh, these are some thoughts about possible ways how to react to these changed conditions, uh, some possible solutions of uh, how to survive under very different circumstances and yet remain creative and true to one's artistic standards. Uh, I've been in classical music business since roughly 1975. I started as a recording producer at a radio station and a composer, arranger, piano player, and a bit later a conductor. I do not know how many LPs, if you know what LPs were, those black vinyl things with a hole in the middle. Uh, I don't know how many of those I recorded. It was probably several dozens. and. Uh, as a producer, I recorded my first CD probably in uh, 1985, and as a conductor in 1987, that I remember uh, quite exactly. It was uh, Haydn Boccherini uh, cello concertos. Since that time, I was playing and conducting concerts around the world, composing music, writing film scores, and recording CDs, uh, many CDs. After I lost count, the estimate of the cities right now is slightly over 200. So for 30 years, I basically did not know much about uh, marketing or promotion because all I had to take care of was to come up with a project and get it recorded or record a project that uh, my label came up with. They packaged it, they distributed it, they marketed it, they promoted it. Uh, actually, in case of Naxos, the label I've been connected with the most, there was not much marketing or promotion because it was a budget label and they relied on uh, products just being sold uh, for low price. Uh, but I just did not care about uh, marketing and promotion anyway. And that's why I ended up with uh, CD covers that came directly from Liberace's House of Crap. Yeah. Uh, despite this, my CD sold in uh, uh, respectable quantities. Again, I, I do not know the exit number by now, but uh, I have a few multiple platinum and platinum and gold and whatever records. Uh, and these are, uh, mainly for classical music, these are considerable uh, amounts. My income was basically my royalties. I had some money from the sales, some from the broadcasting and licensing. Not astronomical amounts, but uh, it was a rather comfortable living for a musician who started playing bars and uh, living in a basement room with no running water. Uh, selling CDs created concert opportunities, so for all those years I didn't even have a concert agent because I simply did not have any time left for more work than I had. On top of that, I wound up uh, completely surprised uh, scoring movies, uh, some of them even in Hollywood, uh, which is probably the most lucrative activity for a classical musician. All this changed completely with internet and uh, the whole digital age thing. 
And it was not a slow change, considering that for at least 25 years I was doing everything the very same way, day after day, year after year. Suddenly, the CDs were not selling anymore, no matter how incredibly attractive the covers were. Uh, everybody started downloading, most of the time illegally, of course. Uh, the moment something was out on CD, it got copied and distributed by websites that were popping up at amazing pace. Labels were surprised, mainly those that uh, did not go into digitizing their content early enough, but even that did not help a lot. Attempts to fight the internet piracy have been mostly futile. Apart from very rare exemplary punishments, mostly cruel and unusual uh, for the scope of the crime, nothing helped. At some point, my label, Maxos, had a full-time employee just going after pirating sites. The success rate was, um, hmm. uh, they managed to close 40 to 50 sites a day, while roughly 300 new sites a day opened. So um, they gave up after a few months of trying and uh, not achieving anything. In their book about 25 years of the company published two years ago, the chapter about me starts uh, with the fact that I am number one of thousands of Naxos artists uh, in, in being pirated. So if you Google my name uh, on any given day, uh, you can get about 50,000 sites with free downloads. Uh, which means pirated copies. And all the people going to these sites are people that do like my music, but will not buy my product. It was an advantage uh, to be with the world's number one label for a long time until the times changed completely. After that, the dinosaur, the giant, just could not move properly to adjust. And at almost the same time, the economic crisis hit, and the first area that the money was pulled from was culture. Nobody needs it anyway, and when the times are hard, even less so. Uh, so these big, slowly moving organizations didn't realize that uh, not only the times have changed completely, but also their usual audience has been dying off and there did virtually nothing to cultivate a new one or to change their ways, so they would appeal at least a tiny bit to people that didn't grow up with classical music. Anyway, about three years ago, I started to feel that the situation in the business is different. My label offered me deals of dubious quality, I would definitely do better washing dishes or parking cars, and I, I'm not kidding. I was going to record two quite important CDs with a brilliant orchestra in New Zealand for free, just for expenses, no fee, and I decided to do it anyway. At about the same time, at a concert we both did not like, I met a young filmmaker and website constructor, uh, Sasha Santiago. First, he was interested in my rare condition, prosopagnosis, which is inability to remember faces, so I won't recognize any of you later. But soon enough, his interest switched to my work, and he started to come up with many ideas that were, for me, very unusual. At that time, I was aware already that the things are not working the way that they used to, and I tried to react. I built my own web pages and smartphone apps, even one that offered completely free listening and streaming of about my uh, 30 of my most successful CDs, together with a paid download option. Uh, the result was quite symptomatic. Many people came to listen, and they apparently liked the music. Nobody was willing to pay for it. The overwhelming majority feeling that free music is a basic human right is very nice, but it won't pay my rent. Uh, as you can see, the ratio is very gloomy. 39,000 free streams, 23 albums sold. 
Needless to say, these are not expensive albums. They generally sell between $4.50 and $9, from which I receive uh, about 10%. And the uh, calculation is very simple. Of about 39,000 people that came to listen to my music to this side, I made about $17. Uh, so in, did not, in this case, it didn't really matter that I was up-to-date technologically. The concept, I give you something for free to lure you into bu buying something, uh, clearly did not work, despite uh, my music was apparently attractive to some people. And uh, consider the fact that this is one of tens of thousands of sites that offer my music for free. So there is probably some interest in it. <clears throat> this way I realized that either the classical music is over as a business, or I and many others have to change our approach radically. It was probably a lucky coincidence that I met Sasha at that very time and started listening to his ideas, mainly about something called multimedia, transmedia, deep media, and I don't know all the names that there are still. Uh, I started with taking him on my next and uh, what was probably last recording trip for Naxos that involved a over 100-piece symphony orchestra. Uh, Sasha took his tiny backpack and even smaller camera and again all odds including a lot of hesitation from New Zealand Symphony, he made a movie. The orchestra, the management of the orchestra couldn't understand what good could possibly come from from a 25-minute documentary about them that was free for them to use and spread around on any social media or other platforms. So they, they limited Sasha's presence in the studio, the amount of footage we could use, and et cetera, et cetera, all kind of problems. But my resourceful companion, however, filmed without permission, got some attractive behind-the-scenes footage, conducted many interviews, and we ended up with an interesting little movie shot on no budget at all, except for traveling expenses. So we have a 25-minute movie on zero dollars. After watching it, the management of the orchestra completely changed their position, gladly shared the movie, and it's still on their web page. And uh, when I watched the interest the movie created just by being posted and listened to incessant stream of Sasha's ideas how to convert, convert the interest into money, I became much more willing to start experimenting in the transmedia department. It was difficult to explain to Sasha that there might be a problem with achieving uh, astronomical sales that he was projecting, just because Mussorgsky and Breiner have a little bit less commercial pull than, I don't know, Kanye West, even when packaged very attractively. <laughs> This was my my best recording ever. Really? Yeah. How did you do that? Because yeah, that's how it felt. This time, it's everything got better than I expected. It's a, the pure resistance of the sound that it's happening. Uh, you know, the sound is, exceeds my expectation. To hear it, I want to hear it. Yeah, I want to have the CDs and just put them in a bask, a bask. So uh, there was some significant interest, and we started thinking about what should we do that would actually be not only artistically excellent but also commercially successful. That was when I told Sasha about the piece I was still working on, but that had very clear outlines already. And it was a cycle of 16 symphonic dances based on Slovak folk songs, uh, mostly quite ancient, called Slovak Dances, Naughty and Nice. 
I was inspired to write this piece by a long tradition of symphonic dances based on folk tunes that good many colleagues of mine composed through ages, but mainly by Brahms Hungarian dances that I orchestrated for London Symphony Orchestra, and by Slavonic dances by my compositional great-grandfather Antonin Dvořák, whose New York residence is the next house from a house I live in New York right now. That's his uh, statue right behind me, in front of my house. <laughs> in all times, I would let the piece lay around till somebody uh, would become interested either in programming or recording it. Uh, but Sasha came up gradually with the idea of making uh, it a transmedia project, but uh, mainly a storytelling project. Because as he explained, and I found out uh, later, storytelling is major. Storytelling is very important. And if you don't carry a story, you won't sell a product. So we, we tried to create a story, a website with streaming and download possibilities with videos, dance movies, folk music, behind the scenes documentaries, food albums. There's a long, long list, trust me. However, it all would start with a recording session with Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, which I worked with before, possibly at Abbey Road Studios. It would not probably be possible to find a label to get behind this even at sounder times. When I mentioned this in passing to Naxos, they didn't give it even a moment of thought before turning it down. And these are guys that could really work out a good deal with an orchestra. Nevertheless, Sasha insisted it could be done and introduced me to a concept of crowdsourcing, Kickstarter, if you will, about which you will hear later at this conference. So, you know, everything is connected. We were both totally green, with me being about six shades greener than Sasha. Sasha had at least an extensive business background uh, because he was selling pool covers in Florida before. I just rec returned from a recording done for no fee, so we both had a real business saving. We made a budget, a modest one, and it came uh, to 200,000 US dollars. And when we did some research on Kickstarter and saw that the largest classical music project there was budgeted uh, less than $30,000 and took a couple months to collect, uh, and everything else didn't even come close, um, we had a lot of courage. So we asked for $200,000 in six weeks. Yeah. Um, well, soon it became pretty clear that it is not going too well. We didn't realize quite a few things. First was that our target group was not a global audience as we hoped. To our big surprise, a project called Slovak Dances attracted mainly people from Slovakia. And Slovakia as a post-communist country is not quite familiar with a few things. Uh, one of them being crowdsourcing. That's a relatively new concept even in the United States, but no matter how well we intended in Slovakia, there is no experience with it whatsoever. Even the concept of contributing or donating money is something that still sounds a little bizarre in Slovakia, that is not really a rich country. And also the concept of trusting a credit card operation is a bit outlandish here even for people that actually own a credit card. So uh, all in all, these factors contributed to um, us not raising enough money. But our learning curve was incredible. Uh, every hour we learned something. Uh, and uh, uh, Sasha was on the verge to go and beg for money with Slovak accordion. But seriously, we learned. We revamped the web page, created another one on Facebook, made us present on Twitter and Pinterest and everything else. Sasha talked me into starting a blog, which at times brought as many as 125 reads per article and brought me personally the Slovak Journalist Prize uh, for the best political commentary last year. 
We switched the fundraising to getting money directly through our webpage online store, shot a short ballet movie with nine dancers they, dancing on the streets of New York on, on Slovak dance music, shot another movie of live performance, shot several Slovak folk musicians performing Oregon, uh, folk songs, and we put everything on webpage. And people started to register our presence. Apart from not big but steady influx of money, still being far from our goal, we found volunteers that wanted to help. A topped graphic team from Vysoká škola Vytvagny Humeni, University of Visual Arts in Bratislava, uh, that created a special folklore-based typeset for Slovak dances. And uh, suddenly, even fan art and street art appeared. In the meantime, the CDs I recorded in New Zealand were released. The covers were just stressing that I was right when I decided to stay away from a big label in the future. Uh, this is probably one of the best CDs I ever recorded, but the cover says clearly, don't buy me. Uh, Sasha, out of spite and uh, just uh, anger, created in about 10 minutes what I think is much better and very effective one, but we couldn't use it. Uh, the attention we raised started getting serious. I got an offer from Ballet of Slovak National Theater that they will uh, create a ballet performance of Slovak dances as the highlight of their 2014 and 15 season. I got an offer from Pohoda, a major, major Slovak outdoor music festival, to present uh, the premiere performance at the, their opening concert. We started using the video of this premiere as a thank you entering gift to our benefactors. Uh, we changed the web page again, uh, and we keep updating it with news and new material on a regular basis. Uh, we created special Slovak Dances t-shirts. And custom-made Converse sneakers. Uh, we organized a fundraising event in uh, New York City with two more coming in December in New York City and Washington, D.C. Our Facebook pages have well over 11,000 friends right now and the number keeps growing. And finally, we started talking to possible major corporate sponsors. As we stand right now with thousands of fans premiere at major event under our belt and a decent level of interest, this is something that most of my colleagues, classical music composer, composers would be uh, extremely happy about already. But we still maintain our focus and our goal, and Sasha is still not getting a job as we were able to lend a sponsor for him. Our intention is to collect a lot of money, record and shoot Slovak dances with Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in London. The next year, create and shoot a live performance, shoot 16 ballet movies with 16 different ballet companies around the world, build an incredible web page around all this that would create some serious online business, and prove to ourselves and everyone else that the classical music does not have to die an ugly death. But if it adapts to this new world of transmedia, it can not only survive, but maybe even thrive. I think there is a world after one that consists of playing music in stuffy atmosphere dressed in tailcoats and trying in vain to sell CDs with ugly covers and 100 times re-recorded music. It's a world of orchestras at rock festival and classical music as a part of immersive transmedia, joyfully accessible to people with minimal experience. It looks like an exciting and interesting world and I'm looking forward to being part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So, questions. There will be 
two, uh, I think, two ladies with uh, staff T-shirts with microphones being around. I see one there. The second one is over there. And uh, you are happy to ask uh, questions in English or in Slovak. If you ask in Slovak, they will translate for you. And in the meantime, Peter, uh, I have a question for you. What would you recommend to a young musician or composer who would ask you for, advi for advice how to, what to do, how to make a living uh, from, yeah. from his profession? I, from time to time, I, I uh, lecture at, at Juilliard about film music, and film music, and first thing I always say my student is, uh, have you been trying something else? Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I really wouldn't wouldn't like to start right now. So Peter, I say I would say yes. I tried a couple of things, but I always come back to music. It's my passion. I want to do this. Well, you know, I I will still try to talk you into something else for two reasons. You One. you will fail. You will fail. I, I want to make music. Well, so then what, what then, next? Then you've done enough. Then keep doing it. That's all it takes. But uh, it's really difficult. Uh, uh, I I wonder how much courage people need today just to start when they see that there is no place to no place to go no place to make uh, money with your music uh, it's it's fairly discouraging so i'm i'm glad that i still see some people but at the other end it's it's competition you know they they should give up because then i have more work ah. <laughs> questions yeah, I see one there. Hello. Uh, I would like to ask, have you been confronted by your former colleagues after you start doing things like that, that <clears throat> what you do is not worth a serious classical musicians and you are doing some marketing pole dancing or, 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 or something like that? I, I didn't understand. <laughs> Či už si, či potom ako si spustil tieto veci, či si bol konfrontovaný svojimi bývalými kolegami, tiež muzikantami, ktorí ti hovorili, že to, čo robíš, nie je hodné muzikanta, seriózneho muzikanta, a že je to také nejaké marketingové tancovanie pri tyči? Uh, no, I, I, I wasn't confronted yet. Uh, probably the main reason is that I, I don't meet those people very often. So, you know, I, I live in New York where everybody is is living uh, on the edge of everything, and and uh, people who would who would really stay behind, they just fall off the train so quickly that they wouldn't even realize what what happened to them. So everybody everybody has to adjust or or die right there. I'm I'm sure that uh, things are different around the world, and uh, and uh, if I was talking to some of my colleagues, for example here, they would they would definitely be at the position you described, that uh, I'm, I'm doing something that is not worth the high art. But I have only one argument. I show them, look where you are, look where the world is. So, you know, that's why you're not having any listeners. That's why you have to play music for yourself. That, that's why at your concerts, not even your colleague would come to listen. So, you know, um, Dancing Pritici is probably the only way out right now. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you. So I see another question over there. Ďakujeme za skvelú prednášku. Žijete v New Yorku, poznáte Bratislavu a chcel som sa spýtať, keď porovnáte tieto dve prostredia, kde sa ľahšie začína? niekomu, kto by chcel teraz začať s tým, čo vy, alebo s nejakým uh, nejakou inou hudobnou disciplínou. OK, so the question was, uh, uh, if I compare New York to Bratislava, which place is uh, better for starting a career of a young musician? Let me guess, neither. I, 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 wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want to start in, in either of those, but uh, it depends. Uh, probably Bratislava has still uh, some sort of sweet illusion about, uh, you know, you just, 
you, you, you can survive on, just on your art and, and uh, being good enough will take you places that if you try and stay with your art, it's all you can, you have to do. But uh, I, just, I just met a few young composers uh, and uh, they are already on, on this train that, that uh, I, had to, I had to jump on very late at my life. So, uh, hmm. uh, it's it's very different. In Bratislava, you have you have uh, more chances because there is there is less competition. In New York, uh, there are many more opportunities and uh, probably uh, better technological possibilities. But the the competition is so fierce that to come through in that environment is extremely difficult. So uh, I would say it's 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 uh, it's the same difficult in both places. Thank you. I have a quick last question. Where can I get those uh, those shoes from? Go to my webpage. You can buy there. Nice. Thank you very much, Peter Breiner. Thank you. Thank you. Big applause. Okay. I had a question. Oh, sorry. One more. Yeah. But come on stage. No, Peter, can you uh, one, one more question? No. Sorry, the, the really uh, stupid question is I have two kids. Okay? One is 16, one is 12. My son, who is 16, he is listening to hip hop, you know, doing this. My, my daughter, she is techno. You know, it's, and I, I, I asked them, why you try classical music? Why should I listen to classical music? What would you tell them? Uh, this is an easy question. I also, I also have two kids and they listen to different stuff, but uh, it mostly depends on what you play at home, what they heard at home. So if I, I if, listen to your music on the live stream, sorry. Yeah, so but... When, when they were growing up, you should have played more classical music around the house so that w they, they would get used to it. Because out of blue, they, they, they won't find it unless they are exposed to it much more. So play more classical music at home and they will get used to it. Thanks. And uh, play most my classical music at home. <laughs> <laughs>